Hi folks, uh, this is Jason, hope you're okay today. Uh, we're having uh, a discussion um, on John Wesley, his life of theology and uh, a kind of popular lively lecture uh, by Mark and um, we might have Claire with us um, to share thoughts as well. So I um, hope you enjoy it and uh, feel free to leave comments under the video. Uh, if you're interested in these uh, topics, okay. So, without further ado, I'll hand over to Mark. Okay. So, John Wesley, uh, an enormous figure in history, he voted in a, in a poll back in the uh, two, early 2000s as one of the best men in Britain. And uh, so, we're going to look at John Wesley tonight, and hopefully, uh, people will get a a vision about who this man was and a sort of a bit, a bit of an enthusiasm to actually look into his, some, some of his sermons and some of his writings and um, some of his theology. So John Wesley, he, uh, he was an Anglican priest and obviously him and his brother Charles Wesley were known as the, the founders of Methodism and they were both two of the main pioneers of the Evangelical Revival in the 18th century with, with George Whitfield. And Wesley was born on the 17th of June, 1703, in Epworth. And he was actually the 15th child of Susanna and Samuel Wesley. And his, his dad, Samuel, was also uh, a, a Church of England priest who had a reputation for naming the sins of the the people in the congregation, so he was, a, he was a bit of a maverick himself. And John Wesley's mum, she 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 often referred to John as a brand snatched from the burning, because the the house caught fire in 1709, and he was saved from the house. And there was a Victorian biographer stated that. When John Wesley entered Charterhouse, he, he went in a saint and left it a sinner. And he was, that was just a, a reference to him being a bit of a maverick himself, a bit of a, a radical. In 1725, he started to show signs of seriousness in his attitude towards the Christian faith as he was preparing himself for holy orders. He was the fourth in a generation of... Anglican priests, and um, he was influenced by three authors. The first, the first author was um, Jeremy Taylor, and Jeremy Taylor, he was a bishop, and he wrote a, a book called Exercises of Holy Living and Holy Dying and that all talked about the purity of heart and the importance of dedicating all your life to God. He was also influenced by Thomas Kempis, his book The Imitation of Christ which was written in 1726 and that talked about the simplicity of intention and another one was by William Law, a book called A Serious Call to the Devout and Holy Life and after that, it convinced John Wesley that it was impossible to be a fractional Christian, but you had to yield everything to God. So as he was preparing for holy orders, he was open to the Holy Spirit. He, he wanted that um, purity of heart and that um, vision for serving God with everything he was and is. In 1728, he was ordained a priest and uh, a year later the Holy Club began and um, it was actually started by his brother Charles and what happened in this is the people met for prayer they studied the Bible they had self-examination and they done works of charitable relief and it was there that the name Methodist was first used and it was, it was used to describe the seriousness of the discipline and the devotion towards spiritual things and um, it was actually used, it had a history of being used to describe 
medical men. So it was a name that was used to actually mock them. When John Wesley's father was dying, he died on the, the 25th of April, 1735, and his last words to John were these. He said to him, the inward witness, son, the inward witness, that is the proof, the strongest proof of Christianity. And he was talking about the inward witness of the Holy Spirit. In this year as well, it was George, uh, sorry, John and Charles, his brother, they sailed to Georgia. And um, the intention was to go out and, and teach uh, the Native Americans um, real Christianity. But what happened is when he went out on this journey, he met some Moravians who were ger German missionaries. And uh, there was a storm up on the ship. And he realized how calm the, uh, the Moravians Mar were. And um, one of the group, Spangenberg, asked him a question. And he, he said, he asked John Wesley, he said, Do you know Jesus Christ? And he, I've got to remember, he, he was, John Wesley was an Anglican priest. And he said to him, well, I know he's the saviour of the world. And this Spangenberg responded by saying, true, but do you know he has saved you? And when John Wesley left Georgia, that question was ringing through his mind. And it's, he records in his journal that he felt like a self-crippled crippled man. And he said in his journal that I went to America to convert the Indians, but who, who will convert me? Um, he was searching for this experience that he'd read about in William Law and Thomas Akempis and, and uh, Jeremy Butler because he witnessed that in the Moravians and he expressed this desire in, in February the 1st, 1738. He said this, he said, The faith I want is a sure trust and confidence in God that through the merits of Christ my sins are forgiven and I reconcile to the favour of God. I want that faith which St. Paul recommends to the world, especially in the epistle to the Romans, the faith which enables everyone that has it to cry out, I live not, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And that hope in his heart, it, be it became a reality, a few months later on the May the 24th and biographers claim that this was the turning point in Wesley's life and he puts it like this this is a famous quote that he wrote in his journal he says in the evening I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistles to the Romans about a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an insurance was given to me that, I, that, I, that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Now, scholars debate, Wesley scholars debate, what actually happened to Wesley here? If Was it a conversion or not? And uh, Theodore Jennings, for example, he suggests that the Aldersgate experience was not a conversion experience since it did not make an immediate change in John Wesley's life. And um, he, he says, furthermore, it was both before and after Aldersgate that John pursued holiness and still struggled with doubt. So he, he says that um, a conversion interpretation of Aldersgate distorts Wesley's mature theology of Christian discipleship. Uh, other other uh, stories disagree. Peter, Peter Gentry suggested that he experienced entire sanctification or the fullness of the Spirit. Uh, Dr. Herbert McGonigal he actually said something sensible. He says, to find out what John Wesley experienced, you need to look at what he said himself. And he suggests that what Wesley said was he experienced an, a, spir a spiritual assurance, an assurance of faith. 
So to conclude the discussion whether John experienced conversion then or if he experienced being filled with the Spirit in Thai sanctification or, or, assur or assurance, you know, it will always be debated. But one biographer says this. He says, um, whatever perspective one takes on John's experience at Aldersgate, one thing is certain. It is surely beyond argument that the pre-Aldersgate Wesley would never have turned Britain upside down. And I think that's, uh, I agree with that statement. He was, he was changed. And um, John Wesley says that God had raised the people called Methodists up to preach scriptural holiness over the land and to renew the nation and particularly the, the Church of England. So he saw it as a move of the Holy Spirit within the Church of England. It did not become a denomination 70 years till after he died. And um, from 1739 until 1791, he travelled 225,000 miles, preached more than 40,000 times, left 72,000 Methodists in Great Britain and Ireland, and with 57,000 members in America alone. And Howard Snyder, Methodist theologian, says this, he says, he says, Wesley's contribution to the history of Western culture and the church are legendary. He notes that we are not used to a popular mass evangelist, a university scholar, a social reformer or a theologian who preaches several times daily and who publishes a whole medical handbook that goes through 20 editions. And so he goes on to know that people have problems with Wesley sometimes because he was, he was such a, a diverse personality, such a diverse figure as we see when we go on. So before I go on, I, do you want to add anything, Jason, to that? Just to add something? Uh, I, I kind of uh, love his background about his mum and his dad, how they, they were godly parents and how they reared the children up uh, and how she reared the children and taught them the word of God and um, you know that was the foundation of of John Wesley. Um, so I, I I always remember that and I, I'm impressed I am with his his mum. Uh, she she had a a big job to bring up so many kids. Uh, and also like the 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 commitment that they had in those days as parents to make sure that the children were were grounded in, in, in God and grounded in the Word. Um, the other thing about you know his heritage, he come from a heritage of ministers like his father was a, a minister and you know they were committed to the gospel uh, as a family um, and you know those things impress me. Um, the uh, I found it, I don't know, I found it funny how at Oxford he, he was really zealous and really on fire, like trying to follow the Lord, and then yet it's this Aldersgate experience. And yeah. so, is it like a false conversion? Was it a false conversion, or was he already converted, and but somehow he had another, like, kind of religious experience? But yeah, but, yeah. But either way, you know, how you can uh, <coughs> be religious and even zealous, but yet not have that real spiritual experience. Um, that's what I heard today by Paul Wilkinson. Uh, his dad told him, uh, this is a theologian who used to lecture at our, our, our seminary, but his dad told him, he said, or his granddad said, that it can go into your... You can know it in your head, but it's got to go into your heart. Mm. Uh, so those are just things that that come to my mind. Yeah, that's good. That yeah, his, his devotion, like even before that, um, Aldersgate experience. I mean, he, he was even looking at 
he had some theology of holiness then, but even before then. Yeah. You know, so... But I was going to look at some of the... Um, his doctrine of holiness, because that's the reason he, he said that God had raised him up yeah. to preach scriptural holiness across the land. And he sometimes he used different terms to describe scriptural holiness. Sometimes he used perfect love or yeah. pure love. Sometimes he he said he talked about entire sanctification. And um, the most popular one he used was Christian perfection. So I'll read some definitions out. Scriptural holiness, he said, the love of God is shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Ghost given unto him. God is the joy of his heart and the desire of his soul. He prays without ceasing in retirement or company, in leisure, business or conversation. His heart is ever with the Lord. With the Lord. He loves his neighbour as himself. He loves every man as his own soul. His one intention at all times and in all things is not to please himself, but him his soul loveth. Yeah. And perfect love, in a letter to Mrs. Elizabeth Bennett, he says, the highest degree of holiness is no other than pure love, a heart devoted to God, one design and one desire. He says, this is interesting, he says, love is the highest gift of God, humble, gentle, patient love. All visions, revelations, manifestations, whatever, are little things compared to love. There is nothing higher in religion. There is, in effect, nothing else. If you are looking for anything but more love, you are looking wide out of the mark. You are getting out of the royal way. And when you are asking others, have you received this or that blessing? If you mean anything but more love, you mean wrong. Settle it then in your heart that from the moment God has saved you from all sin, you are to aim at nothing more but more of the love that is described in the 13th chapter of Corinthians. And Christian perfection, he says, Christian perfection is the loving God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all his mind. This is the sum of Christian perfection. It is all compromised in one word, love. It's uh, love excluding sin. And entire sanctification, he says, um, entire sanctification is not any new kind of holiness. Rather, it is a marked increase in our experience of the love of God. Mm. He says, by the new birth we are saved from the dominion of sin, by entire, entire sanctification from the root of sin. So basically, he summarized scriptural holiness mm. in three main ways. He says, it's purity of intention, dedicating all the life to God. It is giving God all our heart. It is one desire ruling all, all, all our tempers. It is the devoting, not a part, but all our soul, body, and substance to God. He says, number two, it's having all the man that was in Christ, enabling us to walk as Jesus walks. It is the circumcision of the heart from all fullness, all inward as well as outward pollution. It is a renewal of the heart in the whole image of God, the full likeness of him who created it. And he said, three, it's the loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mm. And uh, so he sometimes Wesley got misunderstood in his day. They, they thought he was preaching uh, sinless perfection mm. or glorification. But all he was basically saying, he, he's saying he's, the person is so full of the love of God that sin does not reign. He's not in bondage to sin because he's so full with the love of God, there's no room for sin to dominate. And... Um, he also said it's you know it's a growth in grace. Many people thought he was preaching uh, salvation by works, but it was sal it was uh, works of faith, mm. works of faith, and it was all he, he made it clear that it was all by the grace of God from beginning to end. Mm. Yeah. And uh, one of the one of the questions he got asked was, "Is this uh, entire sanctification? Is it?" instantaneous or is it gradual and then um, he, ba he basically he concludes he says some he says it's both he says sometimes he says he's had testimonies that was instantaneous and he says others it's a growth over a period of time but he put it like this 
all experiences well as scripture shows that this salvation to be both instantaneous and gradual. It begins the moment we are justified in the holy, humble, gentle, patient love of God and man. It gradually increases from that moment till in another instant the heart is cleansed from all sin and filled with pure love towards God and man. man. But even then the love increases more and more till we grow up in all things in him that is our head, till we attain the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. So he talks about um, Martin Luther as well in the sermon on God's vineyard. Wesley says this, I'm like trying to explain the doctrine of sanctification. He says, It has been frequently observed that very few were clear in their judgment, both with regard to justification and sanctification. I'll read that again. It has been frequently observed that very few were clear in their judgment, both with regard, regard to justification and sanctification. Who has wrote more aptly than Martin Luther? on justification by faith alone, and who was more ignorant of the doctrine of sanctification or more confused in his conception of it. But it has pleased God to give the Methodists a full and clear knowledge of each and the wide difference between them. They know indeed that at the same time a man is justified, sanctification properly begins. For when he is justified, he is born again, born from above, born of the Spirit which although it is not, as some suppose, the whole process of sanctification, is doubtless the gate to it. Or this likewise, God has given the Methodists a full view. They maintain with equal zeal and diligence the doctrine of free, full, present justification on the one hand, and of entire sanctification both of heart and life on the other. And the difference he's saying, he's saying Martin Luther, he talked about the Christian has what they called an alien holiness. Oh. And what he meant by that is, when Christ, when we're justified by faith, when, when God looks at us, God sees us so clothed in Christ that he sees us as holy, oh. the holiness of Christ. But what he meant by alien holiness is, is he meant it's an alien holiness because it's not actually real in experience. Oh. So the, the Christian is still always uh, sort of uh, a sinner dead in sin and in bondage of, of, of sin. So although he, he's looked at as holy, yeah. in, in reality, in his Christian experience of living, he's, he's actually, it's not a moral transformation. Wesley went further and said, actually, it is a moral transformation yeah. where you can have power o over that sin. And um, so again, it's like justification, it's what God does us through Christ. Uh, he basically, he, he defined, he said, justification is what God does for us through Christ. Yeah. And sanctification is what God does in us through the Spirit. Uh, so he says this, Though it be allowed that justification and the new birth are in point of time inseparable from each other, yet they are easily distinguished, as being not the same, but things of a wholly different nature. Justification implies only a relative, the new birth, a real change. God in justifying us does something in us. The one restores us to the favour, the other to the image of God. The one is take, the taken away of guilt, justification, the other taken away the power of sin. So, the born again believer is enabled by grace to overcome both inward and outward sin, yeah. in the sense that it does not go on uh, will, willfully sinning, sinning and stuff. So, but that's what's misunderstood about Wesley. You know, he, he did hold to the doctrine of justification by faith, yeah. but um, there was he he, uh, he expanded. On the doctrine of sanctification as well, yeah. which he um, he found in the early church fathers. So, do you know anything, Jay? Uh, uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think, pe think people have misunderstood. I mean, a lot of Calvinists misunderstand, understand, uh, misunderstand John Wesley. Uh, 
don't they? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of them do think that he taught sinless perfection. Like, like, a, like you could be. The the impression that I've got from Calvinist, I mean, I might be wrong, but is yeah. that he believed that you 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 wouldn't you wouldn't sin, but that's not what Wesley's saying, is it? Like you said. Yeah. Um. Well, I I struggle with what he's teaching, which I agree. I agree, it's biblical. It's one. I, I believe it's biblical. I struggle with what he teaches, and in my own experience. Yeah, I do as well. <laughs> you know, in my own experience, it, it's not the way he's describing it. I mean, that's my own fault, but I just feel like. I take two steps forward and then three steps back. It's like there's a, a battle going on all the time, and 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 uh, you know, and I I I kind of like struggle at times. Yeah. Uh, whereas where he's describing, it's like you get this victory, and the root of sin is dealt with, and you get this vic continuous victory type of thing. So. Uh, yeah. The other thing as well is, you know, what role in his theology played. I mean, you might touch on this later, or, or maybe you know the answer. But what role? Well, if, even though uh, the root of sin is dealt with, um, what role do the means of grace play in terms of reinforcing behaviour? So I think I remember Dr. McGonagall. Lecturing on that, where I think he does, he he believed in like five means of grace, didn't he? Like preaching, the sacraments. Oh yeah. Things like that. Yeah, that's interesting, that Jay. Yeah, because he, Wesley talked about as well. He was he was talking about in he he said you can't reach this uh, process of entire sanctification or Christian perfection without the means of grace in the big one. Because he was an Anglican, was the, with the communion. Yeah. Yeah. Which was he was big on. I mean, he was big, big on you know, taking the communion and stuff. Yeah. But he talked in other places about you know, to push on for it. Yeah. And uh, one of the things he talked about a, a, a big part of his theology was the first book of John. Yeah. Where he used to describe spiritual stages, and and he says John in the first book of John, he, he talks about writing to to young men. Mature men and old men. Yeah. You know, I, I write to you, young men. I write to you, fathers. I write to you, and he used that as like um, an evidence to support his doctrine that the stages of growth, mm. stages of spirituality. But the the thing with it is, he he encouraged people to press on into it. Mm. You know, I mean, the the big thing was it's scriptural and it it's it's it, it's um. It's experienced by people as well. So, yeah. But, sorry. Sorry, go on, dear. Uh, is it okay to just say one or two things? Yeah, I can say what you want, do you? Uh, I think one, a couple of things is, one is how Wesley was rooted in scripture and tradition. Like his teaching mm. was like scriptural, but he, he, he kind of really, you know, the early church fathers and the Puritans, and I mean, he was so well read and he, he didn't veer off onto any kind of dodgy writers or dodgy teaching. He was always firmly in, in the Anglican tradition of theology, wasn't it? Like, uh, I, you know, he, he was really deeply rooted in, in uh, like the early church fathers and, and the Puritans and stuff like that. And the, the second, the, the question that I have, is it, from what you said and from from his teaching about entire sanctification how how is that how does that play out in modern evangelicalism like with the charismatic movement with with the evangelical scene that we see now uh, what what can we learn from Wesley about his teaching yeah. in terms yeah. of the light today I'm yeah, I've got some on that, Jay, a bit further on. Okay. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll read through some more of the, the essay here. Okay, mate. So, this one's called, Was, was Wesley an, an Enthusiast? Okay. So, in Wesley's day, there were terms to describe what it meant 
to be an enthusiast. One definition of the word in the 17th and 18th centuries meant that while a person was a fanatic committed to a belief, why a person was a fanatic, sorry, start again. One definition of the word in the 17th and 18th centuries meant that while a person was a fanatically committed to a belief, his or her rational faculties had been switched off and the belief itself was an unjustified delusion. So after this Aldersgate experience, he goes out and starts uh, preaching about this experience. And uh, he got accused of being an enthusiast. And uh, from a religious point of view, it was a madness that ascribed something to God that should not be expected of him and result in the rejection of objective truth or natural reasoning powers. Knox notes that the implications of enthusiasm go far deeper than a rejection of objective truth or reason. For him, at the root of it lies a different theology of grace. Um, so enth enthusiasm was seen as a, a rejection of reason and objectivity, and um, it was taken subjective experience and making that the defined truth for Christian living. So it was a re rejection of reason. So I've put here, shortly after the Aldersgate episode, Wesley began to testify openly to all about his experience of assurance. On the Sunday following, he did the same in the, in the home of John Hutton and was roughly attacked as in a large company as an enthusiast, a seducer, and a setter forth of new doctrines. Other indications of enthusiasm were the love feats that both the Wesleys and George Whitfields would go for Christian fellowship. Wesley recorded, about three in the morning, as we were continuing instant in prayer, the power of God came mightily upon us, insomuch that many cried out for exceeding joy, and many fell to the ground. As soon as we recovered, we broke out with one voice, we praise you then, O God, we acknowledge thee to be Lord. It was meetings like this where Wesley was accused of enthusiasm. However, Wesley and the Methodist movement was labelled as enthusiasm before Wesley's experience at Aldersgate and subsequent love feasts. The first printed attack on Wesley's Methodist movement appeared in the 1st of the December of 1732 in Fogg's Weekly Journal, accusing the Methodists as practicing everything everything contrary, contrary to the judgment of other persons. Another attack by the Reverend Theopolis describes the preaching of the Methodists as tempestuous and dreadful. While whilst Horace Walpole in a letter to John Chu described Wesley's preaching as being eloquent, but towards the end he exalted his voice and acted with very ugly enthusiasm. It was the anonymous letter from Bishop Lavington in 1749 entitled The Enthusiasm of Methodists that really infuriated Wesley. The letter charged the Methodists of having the same conduct and pretenses as the Roman Catholic priests. Lavington tried to prove this by showing how Wesley and the Methodists abused their clergy and put on sanctified appearances and taught on the need of sudden conversion, the assurance of salvation and perfection, whilst the fundamental accusation was the claim of receiving divine inspiration. In divine inspiration. For Lavington, Wesley and this Methodist movement were a set of pretended reformers, a dangerous and presumptuous sect, animated with an enthusiastical and fanatical spirit in which moderation, reason and scripture are things ignored. Wesley replied to Lavington's attack of enthusiasm in February 1749 and suggested that he had misunderstood what he had written. Wesley tried to show Lavington how God had generally worked among the Methodists and transformed Britain and Ireland from vice and darkness towards love to God and his fellow men. In a second letter dated May 8, 1752, Wesley summarises his evaluation of Lavington's attacks of enthusiasm by saying, I have now considered all your arguments. You have brought to prove that the Methodists are carrying out the work of popery, and I am persuaded every candid man who rightly weighs what has been said with any degree of attention will clearly see not only that no one of 
not one of those arguments is of any real force at all, but that you do not believe yourself, you do not believe the conclusion which you make as if you would prove. Only you keep close to your laudable resolution of throwing as much dirt as possible. Wesley concludes his reply by suggesting that the reasons for Lavinson's accusations were nothing more to expose the Methodists to the scorn of mankind and to stir up the civil powers against them. In Wesley's mind, Lavington had taken his writings and distorted them with the intent of accusing him and the Methodist movement as being fanatical enthusiasts who were trying to set up their own sect by claiming authority from subjective experiences of God whilst rejecting the authority of reason. Did Wesley reject the role of reason? This is a Wesley's response that, to the accusation that he rejected a reason. In a letter to his mother in 1725, Wesley called faith an assent upon rational grounds in which faith must necessarily at length be resolved into reason. Wesley's view on reason seems to remain the same after his Aldersgate experience. In a letter dated, 17, January, uh, in a letter dated January the 12th, he states, I am still willing to be controlled by reason. Therefore, according to your account, I am no enthusiast. In a letter to Dr. Rutherford in the March of 1768, he says, it's the fundamental principle with us that to renounce reason is to renounce religion. In a late sermon, 1781, entitled The Case of Reason Impartially Considered, Wesley lays out his developed theological views upon the benefits and the limits of reason within the Christian life. Wesley defines reason much the same as understanding and as a faculty which exerts itself by simple apprehension, which is the most simple act of understanding. Judgment, which is the determining of things which either agree or disagree from each other, followed by discourse, being the motion of progress from one judgment to another. These three operations in the mind are the functions, according to Wesley, of human reasoning. Wesley indicates the limits of reason by showing that it cannot produce faith, hope, love, virtue or happiness in the biblical sense of the word. To those who overvalue it may learn a lesson in humility in not thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought and a lesson of faith in putting our confidence in God with the conviction of our own ignorance. Thirdly, it is a lesson a resignation to submit to the will of God. Therefore, reason by itself is unable to produce anything of eternal value. Wesley also indicates that it is reason assisted by the Holy Spirit that helps us to understand scripture and the attributes of God. Without it, we would not be able to formulate or understand biblical doctrine. This then would result in not being able to live out the Christian faith practically. Wesley states, therefore, you who despise or, de or depreciate reason, you must not imagine you are doing God's service. Least of all are you promoting the cause of God when you are endeavouring to exclude reason out of religion. You see it directs us in every point both of faith and practice. It guides us with regard to every branch both of inward and outward holiness. The role of reason and its benefits in the Christian life are essential in the thought and theology of Wesley. However, as we have seen, Wesley was well aware of its limits. Thorson suggests that Wesley's confidence in the powers of reason were strongest in his earlier years when compared to his theology of grace in his later thought. In other words, although he believed that God would never bypass human reason, he maintained that God's wisdom and ways would always remain above it. We can see that Wesley was reliant on the objective principles of reason. These were fundamental to his theology. Wesley was attacked as an enthusiast because it was assumed that he rejected reason while embracing subjective experiences of God and claiming divine illumination and spiritual gifts. We have seen that Wesley did in fact esteem the role of reason within the Christian life. Therefore, Wesley was not an enthusiast as he did not reject the role of reason completely but showed how it had only certain limits in Christian experience. 
So is that you saying, Jay? Are you still there? Yeah, yeah. It's like he was saying, yeah, he st I'll talk about it a bit later. He was guided by scripture, mm. tradition, reason, experience. Yeah. But he put scripture first. Yeah. And those yeah. few other things were like under it and stuff. So it, it was basically, uh, and that, that comes on to, um, I've got a chapter here called Was Wesley a Charismatic? Yeah. Can we talk about this though for a minute? Yeah, of course we can, Jay, yeah. Because uh, I, 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 I think that uh, he was balanced in that he had reason and experience together. Um, yeah. I think also. Um, um, you know, like like in his own culture. I mean, you had the Enlightenment then, and the Enlightenment, like with Kant and these people and Newman, it was all about reason. And for to say that Wesley was an enthusiast, uh, i.e., I, I, irrational. I remember Doctor McGonagall saying when he was riding his horse going around preaching, he'd have books in his knapsack and he'd be reading various theological and philosophical works and the guy was so well read that to accuse him of being irrational it was just crazy because he, yeah. he, he was a real, you know, he was constantly reading, he was a very learned guy, he'd been to, been to Oxford, he, he, he'd even given lectures at Oxford, um, mm. but yet at the same time the difference between John Wesley and the difference between Kant is that Wesley he didn't despise reason in the sense he used reason he wasn't anti-intellectual but he was willing to submit his reason to God and to depend on the revelation of God and the Holy Spirit uh, whereas Kant wouldn't and these Enlightenment thinkers wouldn't uh, and also for John Wesley the, it, it was a, 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 a a divine connection with the with God and a living experience of God whereas the Enlightenment thinkers it was purely analytical dry philosophical uh, analysis and um, you know experience was only seen something as to be analyzed and dissected whereas mm. for Wesley experience was something living and dynamic in, in terms of knowing God uh, and the other thing as well is that 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 balance that Wesley had you know is is a, a balance that we need today I mean you have Calvinists that are often dry intellectual but they don't have that experience you have charismatics that are often hyper experienced but don't have that intellectual stamp and you know people like Lloyd Jones and Preachers like that, they they kept the balance of experience and the intellect together. Uh, mm. So they weren't anti-intellectual, but but they were that they, they had experience of God and um, uh, but they they also encourage people to think. Um, and also, there's a danger today of people, um, especially in evangelical modern evangelicalism now. They're, they're putting reason above scripture and yeah. they're getting themselves messed up on ethical issues and, and mixed up and bringing the church catastrophe into the church because they're not doing what Wesley did which was submit to the word of God and depend on the Holy Spirit those are my thoughts yeah, yeah. you got any thoughts Claire? Mm. yeah yeah that's right that Jen and even you know even before that Aldersgate experience, Jay, yeah, he was lecturing New Testament Greek as well. Wow. You know, so he, he, he read from the New Testament Greek, that's what he read, you know, um, which is amazing as well. Yeah, yeah. Because he, he, he was, he was uh, well read. I mean, some people take that quote out of context where he talks about how, how I'm the man of one book. And some people today say he only read the Bible. He didn't mean it in that context. Yeah. What he meant was, I mean, obviously he had, he had to read other stuff. Like you say, he read books on his horse. It meant that was the, the supreme rule of faith, the Bible. Yeah, yeah. You know, but what I found looking at this, and we're, we're going to look at this now, yeah. is this is what I'm most passionate about. Was the next bit is was Wesley charismatic? Because a lot of charismatics 
take Wesley out of his context. And um, it, okay, yeah, go on then. Man. Yeah, but yeah. I, I read it anyway. So this is was Wesley a charismatic? It says Butler. This is this was a this was a, um, a bit the Bishop of Durham. Yeah. Wesley's day. Butler defined enthusiasm as a strong persuasion on the mind of persons that they are guided in an extraordinary manner by immediate impressions and impulses of the Spirit of God. It was Butler who accused Wesley as being an enthusiast when in 1739 he said to him, Sir, the pretending to extraordinary revelations and gifts of the Holy Ghost is a horrid thing, a very horrid thing. Butler suggested that Wesley claimed divine illumination from God and endorsed the, the practice of spiritual gifts. In other words, Wesley was basing his theology on experience rather than scripture and upon subjective truth rather than objective truth. At the beginning of the 20th century, Christianity had witnessed the emergence of two great renewal movements of the Spirit. The Pentecostal movement beginning in 1901 and the charismatic movement that developed several decades later. David Barrett reported that in 1992 there were 207 million professing charismatic Christians and that by 1999 the combined total of charismatic and Pentecostal Christians was just under 450 million. What does the term charismatic mean? The word, the word charisma in Greek means gift and it can be used to describe God's gift of love and grace towards us. On a broad level, to be a Christian is to be a charismatic, since all Christians have received the gift of God's grace. However, within the contemporary church, the term charismatic would be identified with those Christians who endorse subjective experiences and the practice of the spiritual gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians 12, 8-10. Some of these would include prophecy, tongues, miracles and healings. Peter Hockney notes that all observations and students of the topic would agree that where none of these gifts are found, the charismatic movement is not present. Our question of if, if Wesley was a charismatic refers to the definition used within the church today. This would include the endorsement of subjective experiences of the Holy Spirit and the practice of spiritual gifts as a normal part of Christian experience. Middlemiss suggests that the contemporary charismatic movement is the closest ancestral, ancestral relative to 17th and 18th century enthusiasm. By this he means that the contemporary charismatic movement is 17th and 18th century enthusiasm repeating itself, where reason and objective truth are rejected in favour for subjective experiences of mystical nature. For Middlemiss, the charismatic movement and the claims to spiritual gifts or signs and wonders are counterfeit. In his controversial book, Charismatic Chaos, John MacArthur takes the same stance as Middlemiss. He also defines charismatic Christians as those who exalt subjectivity as an authority over objective principles of scripture when it comes to defining Christian experience and doctrine. He says, those who place all their emphasis on a subjective validating process eventually reduce the content of revelation and fit to their taste. In addition, he adds, there is little doubt that most charismatics, if they are honest with themselves, would have to acknowledge that personal experience and not scripture is the foundation of their belief system. As much as some charismatics might want to give the Bible a higher place of authority in their lives, the scriptures are often ranked second to experience in defining what they believe. Many charismatics would deny that they place subjective experiences as an authority over objective truth, such as scripture, reason and tradition. Nevertheless, for the purpose of this paper, we will agree with Middlemass and MacArthur that charismatics generally exalt the authority of subjective truth over objective truth when it comes to defining theological theory and theological practice. We will now turn to the experience of the Holy Spirit that people had un under the ministry of Wesley. 
Historians record the beginnings of the charismatic movement back to the beginnings of Pentecostalism that began at the beginning of the 20th century. However, most charismatics could trace their experiences of spirit back into the New Testament. For charismatics, the book of Acts is the, is the New Testament. It is their story and the theological foundation for their practice. Generally speaking, charismatics Charismatic experiences of the Spirit are nothing new. They can be traced throughout the whole history of the Christian Church, beginning at Pentecost in about 30 AD and on to the present day. One of the main aspects of the charismatic experience in the contemporary Church is being slain in the Spirit or falling under the Spirit. American preachers Rodney Howard Brown and Benny Hinn are famous within the contemporary charismatic Church for blowing on people in which whole congregations fall to the ground under the power of the Spirit. However, this phenomenon of falling under the Spirit was displayed more extraordinarily under the preaching of Wesley. Unlike Brown and him, Wesley did not have to blow on anyone. It happened automatically. In the April of 1739, Wesley recalls that as he was preaching, a young man suddenly seized with violent trembling all over, sunk down to the ground. Another incident on the 12th of June 1742 tells that several dropped down as dead as he preached on the righteousness of faith. At another time, 26 people were struck under the conviction of sin, whilst in the August of 1759, Wesley recorded this extraordinary account. I preached on those words in the second lesson, <coughs> we know that we are of God. One sunk down and another and another. Some cried aloud in agony of prayer. I would willingly have spent time with them, but my voice failed, so that I was obliged to conclude the service, leaving many in the church crying and praying, but unable either to walk or stand. One young man and one young woman were brought to Mr. Beveridge's house and continued there in violent agonies both of body and soul. The body convulsions of the young men were amazing. The heavings of his breast were beyond description. But he called upon God to relieve his soul and body, and both were perfectly healed. He rejoiced in God with joy unspeakable. As we can see, um, just a minute, as we can see from these accounts, Falling in the Spirit occurred in the ministry of Wesley. However, did Mes Wesley's ministry include other contemporary charismatic experiences such as healing signs and wonders, laughing and roaring and demon possession? Healing also appears a big part in charismatic spirituality. There are, however, dangers of triumphalism, especially among the positive confession charismatics who promise guaranteed health and healing by just naming and claiming the healing you need. Knowing the formula of faith creates the reality. Uh, many times Wesley claims how people were healed during his preaching, although it is usually unclear if Wesley means physical healing or the spiritual healing that comes at new birth. However, Wesley did frequently investigate and record accounts of divine healing in his journals. Such was the case of Mary Special, who had pain and lumps in her breasts for four years and was healed by a Mr. Bell. When the pain returned a day later, she clapped her hands on her breasts and cried, O oh Lord, if thou wilt, thou make me whole. From that hour, she had no pain or lumps and long after confessed that our breasts were now perfect. Wesley's conclusion was she was ill, two, she was well, three, she became so in a moment. Which of these can with any modesty be denied? Wesley's brother Charles also received a divine healing when he heard the voice of Mrs. Turner say, In the name of Jesus Christ arise, and believe, and thou shalt be healed of all thy infirmities. This healing led later to the conversion of Charles Wesley. Was this healing and conversion of Charles Wesley a demonstration of signs and wonders following the proclamation of Christ? Well, I need a rest, Jim. <laughs> Throat in agony. Right. Uh, do you want to add anything, Jay? Yeah. Do you, have you got some water? Yeah, I'll go and get some. Um. I'll just yeah. Um. 
But uh, just thinking. Um, I'm not. Um, I think there's a difference between the charismatic movement today and John Wesley's time. Yeah. Um, I mean, John Wesley. When, when we're talking about experience that he had and and the experience of the Methodist with the leadership of John Wesley, uh, it. it his experience, the experience that he's having, is root is rooted again in the scriptures, in the Puritan fathers, in the in the early church fathers. It's rooted in certain biblical doctrines like the doctrine of justification by faith and the doctrine of um, entire sanctification. So it, it's very doctrinal. So I don't think it's the same as the charismatic movement. You know, mm. I don't think that the charismatic movement has had that emphasis of doctrine, of um, being interested in church history, such as the early church fathers and the Puritans and things like that. So the experience of the charismatic movement, I think, is a different kind of phenomenon to, to Wesley. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I think I think that uh, the reason I I mean you might disagree, but I the Lord um, there was a there's a passage of scripture where he says I can't do anything in this city or this this area because of unbelief. Yeah, and the Lord couldn't do anything in an area because there was a lack of faith and I think with the charismatic movement is there is this there has been and is this naive faith a belief yeah. in the power of God when I mean naive it's not rooted in any deep theology or anything it is it's rooted in it is rooted in Christ it is rooted in the Bible but it's not it's not like well thought out or anything like that and yeah. there is this faith and belief in Christ and his power and I believe the Lord blesses that I believe that the Lord even though it might be mixed up at times or even though it might get hijacked by false teachers yeah. I, I believe that God blesses people who have faith and and I believe that that's why um, the charismatic movement you know I mean uh, Pentecostalism you know the 600 churches opened um, 2010 in the UK uh, Pentecostal church, charismatic churches and I think like God does bless these people but I don't think it is the same as the Wesley and I think it that it's a theology today that is shallow compared to what Wesley was teaching yeah yeah that's what I think yeah I just can't with reading this bit here then Jane and add a bit so was Wesley a charismatic? I should have went straight to this part, really. Contemporary charismatics, charismatic Niger of Scotland states that Wesley was convinced of the necessity of spiritual gifts. By this, Scotland wants to suggest that Wesley was a charismatic in the contemporary sense of the term. As someone who believed in the necessity of spiritual gifts and who endorsed subjective experience of the Holy Spirit, However, David Allen suggests that it would be a stretching a point to claim Wesley as a charismatic in the strictest sense. For us to evaluate if Wesley was a charismatic or not, in the contemporary sense of the term, we need to let Wesley speak for himself about what he thought of spiritual manifestations and spiritual gifts. In 1739, Wesley concluded that he, would, he could only prescribe people falling over as to the work of God's Spirit, in which people were getting grasped by Satan as they were coming to Christ. Wesley warned against condemning what could be genuine works of God's Spirit, but also suggested that it was unwise to judge inward changes by the outward evidence of manifestations. He concluded by suggesting that the manifestations are either a genuine work of God's Spirit, demonic manifestations, or natural causes such as people exaggerating or getting emotionally carried away. 
In a letter to Dr. Rutherford in 1768, Wesley reported that falling under the Spirit was not at all times or in all places, and that for two to three years they were only constant in London, Bristol and Newcastle. He concludes by saying that they sometimes still occur, but not too often. Wesley was not saying that they stopped altogether, but that they were less frequent than at the beginning of his ministry. In May 1739, Wesley recorded how he had known people who had been transformed while having visions and dreams. God does now give remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Ghost, even to us and to our children. Yes, as far as I have known, and often in dreams and in visions of God. A month later, however, Wesley makes remarks about the false prophecies of the French prophets. He exhorted everyone to avoid these prophets like fire, since they did not speak according to the law of the testimony. He then warned people not to judge a prophecy by appearances, common report or inward feelings. Prophecies may or may not be from God and must all be tested by the law of the testimony. In scriptural Christianity, Wesley says, whether the gifts of the Holy Spirit were designed to remain in the church throughout all ages, and whether or not they will be restored near the restitution of all things, are questions which is not needful for us to decide. Wesley concludes by saying that the important thing was that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit rather than operating spiritual gifts. In another letter to Dr. Middleton in 1739, Wesley says that it is certain that many people may have spoken in tongues, in which the evidence had not been recorded or has since been lost. Wesley also states that he may give the gift of tongues where he gives no other and may see abundant reasons so to do, whether you and I see them or not. For perhaps we have not always known the mind of the Lord nor been of the number of his counsellors. On August 5th, 1750, Wesley also commented on a book he read entitled The General Delusions of Christians with Regard to Prophecy. Wesley concludes that the reason that the miraculous gifts were withdrawn was because dry, formal, orthodox men began to ridicule whatever gifts they never had themselves and to decry them all as either madness or imposture. In a late sermon called The More Excellent Way, Wesley says that the gifts of the Spirit ceased, not because the church had no more need for them, but that the love of most Christians had waxed cold. In summary, Wesley may, as Scotland su suggests, being convinced of the necessity of spiritual gifts. However, he did not practice them as a normal part of Christian experience, as contemporary charismatics do. Although sometimes he endorsed certain dreams and visions on rare occasions, his view on spiritual gifts were the views that most churchmen of his day had, which were that spiritual gifts had ceased at the ap apostolic age. However, they were views. However, there were views among movements like the French prophets who claimed that spiritual gifts were still part of the normal Christian life. Most of the accounts that Wesley investigated of movements who claimed they had spiritual gifts were, in his estimation, enthusiasts who rejected the authority of reason in Scripture. In 1759, Wesley wrote a sermon entitled The Nature of Enthusiasm to de define what he thought were the characteristics of enthusiasm. Wesley felt the need to write this due to the attacks he had received as an enthusiast, as enthusiast from Lavington, Butler and others, who were saying that he and the Methodists rejected reason and received divine illumination from God and gifts of the Spirit. Wesley states that his, his sermon by suggesting that enthusiasm is nothing more than false confidence and follows on to suggest that there are four kinds of enthusiasm. The first kind are the most common enthusiasts who imagine they are Christians and are not, who Wesley calls the worst kind of enthusiasts. The second kind are the ones who imagine they have gifts from God. The third kind are those who think they attain the end without the means by the immediate power of God, followed by the fourth kind, which are those who imagine things to be the providence of God, which are not. For Wesley, enthusiasm is a disorder of the mind which hinges the exercise of reason. It is a religious madness arising from some falsely imagined influence or inspiration of God. Every enthusiast then is, a, is probably a madman. 
It seems clear then that Wesley defines enthusiasm in the same way as critics do. That enthusiasm is a fanatical madness which results in a rejection of objective truth and relies instead on subjective experiences of God defining truth. If we agree with MacArthur and Middlemass, who suggest that contemporary charismatics base their theology on subjective experience as a source of truth rather than scripture, then Wesley was definitely not in the, this camp. For Wesley, experience was al always subordinate to scripture and never above it. The test of all claims to spiritual experiences and spiritual gifts was the law and the testimony. Wesley was not a charismatic in the contemporary sense of the term as someone that practiced spiritual gifts and endorsed subjective experiences. He was charismatic with the view that Christianity was an experiential faith, which should be felt in the heart and not just dry doctrines to be agreed upon. He was open to subjective experiences, but not to the point where they defined Christine doctor doctrine as an authority over scripture. We agree and conclude with Rack when he suggests that Wesley did not go all the way with enthusiasm, he allowed due place to reason. Oh. I even think he would have been an enthusiast if he could, but there was a firmness in his intellectual texture which would not bend to illusions. For Wesley experience had, had to remain within the objective boundaries of the quadrat uh, I can't even say it now. Quadrilateral. Quadrilateral. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's the one. <clears throat> so, um, what he what he's basically saying <coughs> is, he was he, what I'm saying. What, what I was saying is, he wasn't charismatic, Jay. Oh. In the terms of charismatic, what charismatics like the day, because many of them do exalt uh, spiritual gifts oh. and spiritual experiences above scripture. And the thing is. He preached holiness. It was always about holiness. Oh. He always preached about holiness, and and that was the key. And he was he didn't expect signs and wonders to follow. All the time, you know, he was he was he just he was the work of God. And um, the point I want to make is what I see historically. As I think, a lot of the charismatics today, are like those French prophets, Wesley opposed. Oh. I think they're in that same stream, a lot of them. Um, so, any any thoughts, Jay? Uh, yeah, I think it's really good, well researched. It's really, really good because he researched it well. Um, uh, just thinking. Um, uh, there's just loads of things to, to say really. Um, I, I I thought it was wise how he said how he talked about physical phenomena, how uh, people who were shaking and things like that, how he was saying that it's important not to be taken in as an evidence of God. Not not to completely dismiss it, but that ultimately it's whether it's the inward work of your life that yeah. is the true test of whether God's been at work or not and if you look at like uh, the history of re revivals and if you look at it today um, like with the Todd Bentleys of this world where um, we had a few years ago the Toronto Blessing and we had that guy I don't, can't remember his name where he falls over laughing and they all fall over laughing and, yeah. Um, people can soon be taken in by physical phenomena, people laughing or chuckling like chickens and saying that this is of God. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. and Wesley wouldn't have been taken in by that. He would have said, "Well, what's it? What's happening with your life? How's your life been?" Um, but the thing I like about Wesley and true even true true Christianity is it, always got that balance of of doctrine and life and that's what Wesley was all about everything was you know it it was all his experience was based on the objective word of God and objective truth from that word yeah and, um, you know a lot of experience today within the church uh, all these new movements it, it's not it's not got that 
that uh, depth and that stability. Um, you know, so Wesley is such a such an inspiration, and um, but at the same time, Wesley was not narrow-minded. He was open to the to the spirit. He was open to what the spirit might be doing. Uh, mm. he, he didn't reject things out of hand if people had visions or didn't reject the power, the healing power of God or anything like that. He was open to to what the spirit was doing, and yet. On the other flip side, there are a lot of people today that f any kind of enthusiasm, any sense of uh, zeal for God, or uh, believing that God can heal, or believing that God can do things, and or believing in the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit can do, that they fear that, mm. and and so there's the two extremes of those who are. Uh, are just jumping into any movement that comes, whether they're click it, clucking the, the, making chicken noises or falling over laughing. Yeah. Whether, whether they just run to any new movement, but it's got no stability or base because it's not rooted in the word, it's not objective. And yet the other extreme of people who, um, who just, you know, any any the slightest mention of the Holy Spirit, and and they get all jittery. Um, I just think Wesley's amazing. Yeah. You know, and he didn't get it right all the time. I mean, he, he probably made mistakes on trying to work out whether some of these phenomenons are, are right or not. Um, mm. It's interesting It's interesting how he denounced these prophets. It, it, uh, I, what I find interesting is how he was accused of, his, accused of enthusiasm. Mm. And how he defended himself against that, and then how he attacked the these French <laughs> prophets for being yeah. enthusiasts. So what's the yeah. difference? What is the difference between his defense of himself and his attack on the French prophets? Um, yeah. Uh, and um, like that, I think I think yeah, you touched good, on that's it. a good question, actually. I think you touched on it about. He, he, he had this objectivity on the on his basis, but what I find interested in is he opposed these French French prophets, and uh, you know I'm I'm guilty of this. I I kind of try. I kind I I I kind of don't like um, being too critical. You know, if people would say they believe in Jesus. Then that's good enough for me, and I don't like to be too too critical. But if uh, there are people who are teaching things that are wrong under the guise of charismania, charismatic stuff, yeah, then if Wesley was here, he would call them out on it. Yeah, wouldn't he? So just a thought. Oh yeah, no, that's good. That this is. Here's the question I've wrote here. I'll just finish this now. This I say a bit. This, so I'll come to a conclusion. The relevance of John Wesley's theology, like for today. In the book, A New Kind of Christian, Brian McLaren suggests that a new model of doing church is required if we are to reach the postmodern generation with the gospel. The story is of a pastor who is struggling to express his faith in a postmodern culture. He finds that his theology no longer seems relevant to him or to the church he is leading, as his reformed epistemology is based on a modern system of doing theology. The old model of expressing practical theology is no longer working, and he fears that he may soon have to leave the ministry. He meets a friend called Neo, who helps him through. Have you read this book, Jay? Who is it? Brian McLaren, a new kind of Christian. No, no, go on, mate. You'd have to, you'd have to get. This is a book about. It's a post, it's post modernity stuff. The old model expressing practical theology is no longer working, and he fears that he may soon have to leave the ministry. He meets a friend called Neo, who helps him through the many questions he has about truth, faith, theology, and the pressures he faces in needing to express Christian faith in a way that is relevant to postmodern culture. This book 
is just one amongst many on the problem of how the church can express Christian faith in a way that will be meaningful, real and relevant to postmodern culture. What is postmodernism? Even this question poses a problem for postmodernism, since postmodernism has trouble in defining what it is itself and disagrees on the different interpretations. The term postmodern may have been coined in the 1930s to refer to a st an historical transition already underway. James Sayer suggests that the acknowledgement of the death of God is the beginning of postmodern wisdom. It is both more than and less than a worldview, which is a float in a pluralism of perspectives and a plethora of philosophical possibilities, but with no dominant notion of where to go or how to get there. With postmodernism, no story can have any more credibility than any other, since all stories are valid. Stanley Grinch suggests that at the heart of postmodernism is the radical rejection of the modern intellectual outlook, and the loss of the modern worldview marks the end of the objective world of the Enlightenment project, with its emphasis on an empirical knowledge of reason as the source of all truth. The modern worldview had been under attack since the time of Nietzsche. However, the postmodern roots began with, with Kierkegaard. Is that, his, is that how you pronounce his name, Soren Kierkegaard? I think so, mate, yeah. yeah. Kierkegaard suggested that faith was subjectivity and a leap into the dark. Thus, a good definition of postmodernism would be, this is my truth, tell me yours. In summary, postmodernism is a, a reaction to modernism. It is a culture of subjective experience which rejects universal reason, theoretical systems and objective truth. It is a world of individualism in which you can attach meanings to experience but not truth. Since objective truth no longer exists, only personal opinions, thus truth becomes subjective. There is a mixed reaction to postmodernism within the church, some are for it, whilst others are against it. We saw earlier that Wesley was accused in his day of being an enthusiast and is sometimes laboured by some in the contemporary church as charismatic. We saw that these movements are based on subjective experience and that they often react against objective truth as an authority whenever it does not endorse their belief system. However, Wesley was against beliefs that were uh, Wesley was against beliefs that were totally objective and did not have an experiential or subjective side to it. Christianity also needs to be felt in the heart and not just agreed upon in the head. Wesley made this clear to the Methodists when he said orthodoxy or right opinions is at best but a very slender part of religion. For Wesley, Christianity, Christianity has an objective set of correct beliefs and a subjective commitment of a person. Wesley's theology was both empirical and experiential. Truth for Wesley was entirely objective and partially subjective with the latter always in submission to the former within the boundaries of scripture, reason, tradition and experience. There are reactions for and against postmodernism. McLaren's book is a voice for how many people feel within the evangelical church. He reminds us that Christianity always needs fresh expression within the culture we are li living in. Nevertheless, there seems to be a dangerous element within this book as it seems to suggest that evangelicals may have to abandon traditional beliefs and practices. McLaren is slowly pulling away from history and orthodox, orthodox practice. In other words, he's becoming postmodern within his theological system and the postmodern worldview is built on subjective experience. Wesley is a voice within the evangelical church today who can remind postmodern disciples that truth is not subjective but objective and that looking back into history rather than abandoning it is what can take the church forward. Wesley's epistemology is theocentricity, immanence, heart, conversion and Bible. This is the safety zone against subjectivity defining truth since it is objectivity rooted in scripture, tradition, reason and God himself. Wesley's epistemology is also a reminder that experience must grow out of doctrine rather than doctrine grown out of experience. 
Faith and truth, according to Wesley, is not a leap into the darkness of subjectivity, but a leap into the light of objective truth within the safe, safety zone of scripture reason, tradition and experience. Um, the kind of Christianity Wesley taught and wanted to see throughout the whole world was uh, that Christian, Christianity was a call to a happy and holy life with a good conscience towards God and man and power over all sin. Wesley defined holiness as loving God with all our heart, mind, soul and strength, loving godliness and hating sin. We can say that the role of experience in the theology of Wesley is an empowerment for holy living. This holiness is orthodox, orthopraxy and orthopathic, where right belief leads to right practice and right practice leads to the right experience of Christianity, which is a holy life. It is also social and corporate, not mystical or of a total individual nature. Wesley's theology of experience has relevance for postmodern discipleship because it should lead to practical Christian action and empowered Christian living. Um, Maddox notes how some contemporary scholars scoff at Wesley's significance as a theologian. What these scholars fail to see is that Wesley's theology of experience was practical at every level, as well as theoretical. He put theological theory into practice as well as reflecting theologically on his practice and altered it where, wherever necessary, such as his doctrines of assurance and sanctification. Carter writes that Wesley thought theologically, spoke and communicated theologically, administered the Methodist movement theologically and he even died theologically, affirming the best of all, God is with us. Wesley's empirical and experiential system is complex and is the reason why he sounded like an enthusiast to a rationalist and like a rationalist to an enthusiast. To conclude, Wesley's theological system ultimately leads to doxology, which is expressed in social holiness, which is where all Christian theology must ultimately lead. And the reason why Wesley's theology of experience is relevant today for, for postmodern discipleship. So again, he's... Um, Wesley Wesley stuck to history, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He, he, was, he was rooted in uh, in history, and what I like about Wesley is there was two kinds of people in, in his time. There was there was the, the rationalists, yeah, the high church people, who were probably at lib the liberals of the day, and there's the enthusiasts. Well, that were probably the um, Maybe it's like the charismatics, you know, or, or the um, the people like MacArthur, maybe, or Piper. And the thing was, is both people were the both camps were uncomfortable with him because <coughs> what the author says when he was with the um, when he was with the the um, enthusiasts, they thought he was liberal. He thought he was high church because he had, he, reason played a big part in his theology and the rationalism. But when he was with the high church people, the liberals, they just thought he was an enthusiast because of his, his experiential side yeah. of theology. So they couldn't really put him in a box. Yeah. You know, and um, I just think he was amazing. I, he was amazing because... Um, because he was flexible, but he was balanced at the same time. Mm. And I just think, I think his philosophy ministry is amazing, you know, because he's not one or the other, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, but I, I, I don't know, what do you think, Jay? Uh, I thought it was a great lecture. I thought it was very scholarly. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a really good uh, lecture, well footnoted and uh, excellent. Um, I like the ending, talking about postmodernism and stuff like that. I thought you were bang on when you said that uh, postmodernism is a re reaction to modernism. I thought that was bang on. And uh, this issue about 
history uh, is absolutely key to this whole, the whole I don't think people realize that this is very very important in terms of where we are now as evangelicals and where we're to go in the future because history played a, a big role in Wesley's thinking and if you, if you look at the Enlightenment when you look at Immanuel Kant tradition and to the Enlightenment thinkers like Immanuel Kant tradition didn't mean anything you know we gotta break the shackles of tradition and we gotta use reason and move on for Wesley he used reason but tradition was important the early church fathers the Puritans and all that were, were very important to him and I think that um, being in the Methodist for a short time when I was working with them um, a lot of their chapels were closing down or struggling and the hierarchy of the Anglican uh, of the Methodist what they were trying to do is they were trying to use new types of church like messy church and um, and all these different new fangled ideas about what church is and yet the thing that they'd lost sight of and um, why these churches were closing down is they'd lost sight of their historical roots yeah that the tradition if, if you know like the Pharisees the Pharisees used tradition as a way of controlling people they used tradition uh, in a dead way but there's also a good use of tradition because it talks, it talks about in the Bible earnestly contend for the faith and the gospel has been preached in past generations there have been past Christians and that's part of our heritage and it's a living heritage so we can look at Irenaeus, we can look at uh, John Chrysostom, we can look at in time of Wesley uh, the Countess of Huntington, Hannah Moore uh, we can look at all these people who were preaching the gospel or or um, disseminating the gospel and that, that's a living tradition and that's our mm -hmm. heritage and if we haven't got an interest in church history if, if we haven't got an interest in our tradition uh, then if we don't know our past well, then we don't know our present and we won't know our future so, yeah. uh, for, so I think that's really important um, and um, in terms of postmodernism, I think we have to be careful. Uh, with postmodernism, there are good things about postmodernism and the negative. One of the negative things about postmodernism is it's relativistic, so it relativizes truth. So as evangelicals, um, we're objectivists. We believe in objective truth, and we our faith is not based on subjectivity. It's founded on objective truth that Jesus died and rose again can be verified objectively in history and our subjective experience is based on objectivity whereas postmodernism it, uh, it denies objective truth is relativistic but at the same time postmodernism is a reaction to uh, modernism and part of that reaction is uh, modernism saw knowledge is purely scientific whereas postmodernism is saying no there are other types of ways of knowing like for example art and I think uh, that is a you know that is a good thing to, to remember that there are some good things about postmodernism that it, it, it tried to it's tried to challenge this monolithic understanding that we, we only look at things from one perspective ie the scientific method whereas postmodernism is saying no your life's much more varied and richer than that and, there's, and that, that's the struggle that postmodernists are having, have had, is that they're sick and tired of this kind of monolithic, you can only look at things one way. Uh, so, you know, and Christianity mirrors that. You know, Christianity is not just about science. Um, Christianity is also about historical truth. It's also about exp experience. It, it, it says things about family. It says things about art. It says things about philosophy and politics. Um, all the many concerns that postmodernism has, has been writing about. Um, so you know, Christianity. With Christianity, you get the modernist perspective. You get the objective truth. Uh, mm. But you also get the postmodernist desire for variety and experience in Christianity. You get the both married together in Christianity. Mm. 
those, yeah. those are my thoughts. But I thought it was really good how you ended it on postmodernism. Yeah. Because I think, you know, I think the postmodernists to look at Wesley, I think it would, I think they'd appreciate him, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah. I think there's a, there's a danger, um, there's a couple of dangers and a couple of positive. I think there's a danger in, you know, there's been a, a lot of lectures by various preachers and lecturers over the years on church history. Uh, there's a danger of romanticizing the past uh, or harking back to the past where as if like that's, we're, we're waiting for that Wesley type experience or Whitfield type of experience and that God isn't doing anything today type of thing and, and I know you're not saying that but there is there are people that look at the past and they're kind of in their own little world they're in they're in a they're in a, a kind of uh, historical castle and they're not actually engaged in the real world so there's a danger in looking at church history in that way but mm. at the same time I think young people have to realize that church history is exciting and that um, people like John Wesley uh, are ex can be exciting to our faith uh, and mm. are important to our faith because you know again if you read Hebrews I think it's chapter 11 and it talks about the heroes of faith you know yeah. and, and you know these people these people uh, lived they died for the faith and uh, if you allow the Holy Spirit to work in you as you read these people, you can be inspired today in your faith and equipped uh, to to do ministry. You know, and like you you mentioned that Wesley was quite rich and complex. That young people especially can get so much uh, from studying John Wesley and studying his sermons and studying his his diaries. Um, so it's not a wasted time. It, it it's a uh, it's a valuable time. Yeah, it's great, actually. Uh, I've nothing else to add. Uh, yeah, that's it. I'm finished now, Jay. All right. I really enjoyed that, mate. Um. So if you want to make comments, uh, feel free to make comments under the video. And, uh, you know, what do you think of John Wesley? Do you think he's relevant today? And do you agree with some of the things that Mark said or I've said? And uh, just let us know what you think. And uh, we just hope that this will inspire you in your faith to walk closer with the Lord and to depend on him and to go forward in your ministry and, and in your walk with the Lord. So... Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mark if he's going to close in prayer or, or whoever, but uh, do you want to close in prayer, Mark, or Claire? Or? Yeah. Lord, thank you for this time together, Lord. Thank you for the, the life of John Wesley, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that um, we be as devoted as him, Lord, and as passionate as him for the gospel, Lord. We just give you all the praise. Amen. 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 Okay, folks, thank you for listening, and God bless you, and see you around. Take care.